All right, this is going to be Chapter 18, The Urinary System, Part 1. And in, this is a general overview here. Uh, we're going to start talking about the urinary system. Uh, urinary system does several things. It regulates blood volume and blood pressure, regulates plasma concentrations, uh, helps stabilize blood pH, and conserve valuable nutrients. Now, uh, how it adjusts blood volume and blood pressure? Uh, loss of water, loss of urine, EPO, which adjusts red blood cells, uh, and then renin. Renin is in the angiotensin, um, aldosterone, angiotensin uh, chain, if you will. Uh, angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2, and both of them are located in angiotensinogen, which we'll talk about later on in this section. Um, Regulate plasma concentrations of ions, concentrations of sodium, potassium, and chloride, and other ions by controlling uh, the amount of urine lost. Stabilize blood pH by stabilizing hydrogen ions. So the adjustment of hydrogen ions, very simply, uh, pH, how we uh, test for um, acidity, pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. So by adjusting those in or out, we can adjust overall acid-base arrangement. Uh, and then conserving valuable nutrients, uh, glucose, amino acids, uh, they're conserved by preventing their secretion. Uh, figure 18.1 in your book, uh, kidneys located in the retroperitoneal area. We're going to talk about the ureters, which this is what allows for a collection of urine in the bladder. Uh, urinary bladder temporarily stores the urine and then in the urethra. Uh, conducts urine to the exterior. The organization of the urinary system. We're going to talk about kidneys, urine, ureters, urinary bladder, and urination in this section. Uh, the kidneys. Superficial and secondary anatomy, the blood supply to the kidneys, and the nephron in this subsection here. Kidneys are located in your retroperitoneal area, uh, which is dense fibrous renal capsule packed in a soft, tissue, soft cushion of adipose tissue or a little bit of fat. And if we'll notice here, this is your kidney, and this is your retroperitoneal area. This is your peritoneal cavity in here. So highly vascular supply to the kidneys. It's coming in through your ureters, through the bladder, and then the urethra, which would expel it out to the exterior of the body. Superficial and secondary anatomy. Uh, these are mostly terms. The helium or indentation is the site of exit for the ureters. Renal capsule covers the surface of the kidney and lines the renal sinus. Renal cortex, outer division of the kidney. Renal medulla, inner division of the kidney. Renal pyramids. Uh, kidneys contain 6 to 18 conical subdivisions. And these are called renal pyramids. Renal papilla. Projections into the renal sinus, minor calyx, cup shaped drain for urine, major calyces, minor calyx merge to form a major calyces, and these are um, where the filtrate of the urine will actually be put into the ureter. Nephrons, urine production begins here, about 1.25 million nephrons, uh, and, if, and we talked about this also in uh, like the respiratory chapter where if we put all of these end to end, their combined length would be about 145 kilometers. When we're talking microscopically, we, we, we have tons of surface space. All right, let's figure 18.3. Uh, this is the cortex up here. Let's start off with this. And these are, let's see, these are major and minor calyces. And these are going to be coming from your renal pyramids. You have uh, a corpuscle here, and then you have another one uh, located lower down in the pyramid itself. And these are collecting ducts. So this is where all of the urine derives from. And we're going to talk about this in detail. Proximal convoluted tubule, loop of inlay, uh, distal convoluted tubule. Collecting duct. Once it gets into here, this is this is about the last chance before it becomes urine. This is the last chance. Once it's in this area here, or 
rocks come into the actual minor calices or major calices. It is your uh, helium. That's where the ureter comes out. Um, and then this will be the ureter. And then this is a kidney, uh, actual live kidney instead of an artist rendition. So blood supply to the kidneys. Uh, more terms. Renal artery. Artery that feeds, originates from the abdominal aorta. Uh, and then we have two different arterioles here that are kind of important. Uh, afferent arterioles, delivers blood that supplies the nephron. And efferent arterioles, blood leaves the nephron through this vessel. And then we have juxtamedullary juxta nephrons. And they are located near the renal medulla. And these will be down towards the inner core. So down this, this area here, the outer area would be the cortex. And then down towards the core is where these nephrons would be located. Located near the renal medulla. Uh, these capillaries are connected to the vasa recta. All right, so figure 18.4. These are the nephrons, very tiny little thing. It's this up here. We'll talk about this kind of separately in a second. And this is the juxtagula medullary nephron down here. Uh, and this is located a little bit uh, south would be a good word for this. This right here is the minor calluses. Uh, again, this is going to open up into major calluses where urine is collected. All right. So afferent arterioles are here, and we'll notice the afferent arterioles run into the nephron, which we're going to learn here in a second, have a glomerulus, and this is where urine is, the start of urine production takes place. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. This down here would be the loop of Henle. And then this back in here, this area here, is going to be the distal convoluted tube. Now, why this is important is each phase of this, here, here, and here, we're going to essentially adjust different things. This last part here, the distal convoluted tubule, comes under the direct stimulation of aldosterone and things like ADH. So whenever we start talking about this, uh, we're, those two hormones we need to pay uh, good attention to. Um, this is the renal artery uh, and the renal vein. And afferent and efferent arterioles. Let me see. The efferents are located except for here. Uh, efferent would be input and then efferent would be output. Uh, the nephron. Overview. Uh, fun basic functional unit of the kidney is composed of two main parts, a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule, composed of two convoluted segments. We're going to talk about those in detail. Blood arises at the glomerulus by the way of the afferent arterial. So afferent and then efferent exit. Blood arises by the, at the glomerulus by the way of the afferent arterial and departs in the efferent arterial. Uh, blood pressure forces the fluid and, dis, and dissolves solutes out of the glomerular capillaries. This process is called filtration or urine production. From the renal corpuscles, the filtrate enters the renal tubule. Components of this are the proximal and distal convoluted tubule of the loop of Henle. Uh, function, reabsorbing all of the useful organic uh, molecules from the filtrate, reabsorbing over 90% of the water in the filtrate, secreting into the tubular fluid any waste that were missed by the filtration process. And this whole process here, Glomerulus, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and then the distal convoluted tubule. Every step, proximal, loop, and distal, has a specific job and a specific part in this. All right, so this is figure 18.5 in your book. 
this is the nephron, and this nephron is the glomerulus, and the afferent arterial is the input side, and then this is the output side. Now the pressure that's exhibited in here starts the filtration process. process. When the filtration process starts, it goes, the actual filter goes into the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, at this point here, it pretty much resembles plasma. Now, in the proximal convoluted tubule, reabsorption of water, ions, and all organic nutrients take place. So, if we want it, now is the time to get it. Now, as it moves in the proximal convoluted tubule, it starts uh, concentrating on itself more and more and more. Or it's like, okay, I've got all of that I want out of this section. You can, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's waste. So then it will continue on. Now, whenever we get into the loop here, or the loop of Henley, this is where we get an opportunity to pull water from the area. Uh, loop of Henley, further reabsorption of water in the descending limb. This is permeable to water. <laughs> And both sodium and chloride ions in the ascending limb. Now, this here is going to move sodium and chloride in and out as necessary. And this would be whatever the body needs as far as balance goes. Now, this area here, we talked about the loop, we've talked about the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, we're going to talk about the distal convoluted tubule. In the distal convoluted tubule, we secrete ions, acids, any kind of drugs that are eliminated out of our body through biotransformation and toxins will be um, maneuvered into the distal convoluted tubule. Variable reabsorption of water and sodium ions, and this is under hormonal control. The two hormones that it's under, antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. And aldosterone adjusts sodium. Okay, so once it hits the collection system and the collecting ducts, this right here is urine. The distal convoluted tubule, under the effects of these two hormones, either the urine is going to be very, very concentrated or very, very dilute. And it depends on what the actual CNS, um, central nervous system, input is on what our fluid balance or what kind of fluid that we need. So again, these two hormones here adjust fluid levels in the distal convoluted tubule. Let me see if I can erase this without. Okay, so let's talk about filtrate first. Filtrate is developed in the glomerulus. Water moves out here, and solutes move out here. So any of these ions would be considered as a solute for getting nutrients and so on. Water moves out of the descending limb, and ions or solutes move out in the ascending limb. This area here moves ions out and in, depending on the needs of the body. Last opportunity is right about here, that under the effects of ADH and aldosterone. And this is going to combat things with sodium. Water will move in or out of the distal convoluted tubule. In the collection system, this is about our last opportunity to mess with it. And this is all going to take place off of what I got told in the distal convoluted tubule. Once it makes it to this point here, it's urine. The nephron continued. The renal corpuscle contains a capillary network and a structure known as Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule is the kidney's version of the pericardial cavity of the heart, or the pericardial cavity of the heart, my apologies. The glomerular capillaries are said to be fenestrated or have pores in them, and that's so the filtration can push in and out very nicely. The proximal convoluted tubule, next term. The next step in the filtrate moves, uh, next step 
in the filter uh, movement is cells absorb organic, organic nutrients, plasma proteins, ions from the tubular fluid. Solute concentration of the interstitial fluid increases while that of the tubular fluid decreases. Uh, water then moves out of the tubular fluid by osmosis, and this is going to be going from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. The next thing that it goes into, this is a proximal convoluted tubule, is the loop of Henle. The loop is composed of a descending end and an ascending end. The ascending limb is not permeable to water. The descending limb moves water out by movements of the sodium ions. The ascending limb is where the drug ferrosamide works. If we keep more sodium in there, whenever it gets an opportunity, water is going to follow sodium, thereby making more urine available. So, again, in the glomerulus, afferent in, efferent out, filter starts, water, ions, anything we wanted to tap up front in the proximal convoluted tubule. Descending limb, permeable to water. Ascending limb is not permeable to water. We haven't made it to the distal convoluted tubule yet, but we'll talk about it here in just a second. The fenestrations that we were talking about. These pores located here, this is a blow up of a cross section in the glomerulus. This is the proximal convoluted tubule right here. Afferent, input, efferent, output. Nephron continued. Uh, the distal convoluted tubule. Uh, important site for the active selection of ions, acids, drugs, and toxins. Also, the selective reabsorption of sodium from the tubular fluid. This is the last segment of the nephron. The collection system, once it makes it to the collection system, consists of a collection of papillary ducts. Each collecting duct receives tubular fluid from many nephrons. Final adjustments of sodium, potassium, and hydrogen, and bicarbonate ions occur here. Once it makes past this, it is urine. So again, filter forms, water and ions retapped and resourced by the body, permeable to water to allow water to come back into the body as necessary, concentrating the urine more. Ions moving out at this point here in the ascending limb, non permeable to water. Distal convoluted tubule, ions moving out, ions moving in, water moving out. Collection system or the collecting ducts, last opportunity to move anything in or out of the body. This is urine. Again, one more time, nephron, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, afferent arterial, efferent arterial, proximal convoluted tubule, descending branch of the loop of the Henle, ascending branch of the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule under the effects of ADH and aldosterone, collection system, last opportunity to move in and out of ions and fluid. Once it makes it to here, it's urine. Basic principles of urine production. Uh, filtration at the glomerulus, reabsorption and secretion along the renal tubule. Clinical note, acute renal failure, we're going to talk about that. And the control of kidney function, hemodialysis, and the treatment of kidney failure. Uh, three main met metabolic wastes occur in urine production. We have urea, creatinine, and uric acid. Urea is the most abundant organic waste and it comes from the breakdown of amino acids, urea amino acids. Creatinine, generated in skeletal muscle through the breakdown of creatinine phosphate, which plays an important role in muscle contraction. And high, high energy phosphate groups are assist us in muscle movement and muscle energy. Uric acid, uh, produced through the breakdown of recycled ribonucleic acid. So all of these things are moved out of the kidneys and moved into urine production. Basic principles of urine production continue. This occurs in Bowman's capsule and glomerulus. We have the development of filtration. 
blood pressure forces out the water across the filtration in the renal corpuscle. Solutes are carried out by the water in the system. Reabsorption, another term. Removal of water and solutes molecules from the filtrate, and this is what would be in the tubule, and their reentry into the peritubular capillaries outside the tubule. Secretion, uh, transport of solutes out of the peritubular capillaries across the epithelium into the filtrate. And this would be secreting more of the solutes, ions, waste, and whatnot. Summary of the principles of urine production. Filtrate occurs in the renal corpuscle across the capillary walls of the glomerulus. This is where in Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus is where filtrate begins and the formation of urine begins. Reabsorption of nutrients occur at the proximal convoluted tubule, the first part of the tubule. Active secretion occurs primarily at the distal convoluted tubule. Regulation of the amount of water, sodium and ions, and potassium ions in the urine result from the interaction between the loop of Henle and the collection system. So the loop of Henle is important. Remember the descending and the ascending branch. The descending branch is permeable to water. The ascending branch is not permeable to water. Filtration at the glomerulus. Filtration pressure. The net force that promotes filtration the pressure is low at about 10 millimeters of mercury. The efferent arterial is smaller than the afferent arterial. This backup process causes more pressure in the glomerulus. Glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, is the amount of filter produced in the kidneys each minute. And this is about 125 milliliters a minute. Filtration depends on the amount of blood flow to the glomerulus and normal filtration pressures. Quick clinical note here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. The number one cause of kidney failure in a person that's having heart, um, a heart transplant, a bypass, or anything like this, is not watching their overall blood pressure or not being able to do anything about their overall blood pressure. If their blood pressure drops uh, and the kidneys aren't perfused, very simply, glomerular filtration rate drops through the bottom of the floor. Urine production and essentially goes to very low, if not zero. In an adult patient, 30 mils of urine an hour is what you should produce. Uh, so if you have somebody that is post-gabbage or post-heart transplant, please take a note at their urine production. Uh, it's very important. If they're not making that, then they could have some decreased kidney function from hypoxia or hypotension. Reabsorption and secretion along the renal tubule. Events at the proximal convoluted tubule, and this will be the first part. Glomerulus, uh, proximal convoluted tubule. Actively reabsorb organic nutrients, plasma proteins, ions from the filter. A few substances, hydrogen ions, as an example of this, can be actively secreted into the tubular fluid. This plays an important part in the maintenance of blood pH. If there's too much Hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. Very simply, it's just going to move it into the urine filter, which will make the urine more acidic. Events at the loop of Henle reabsorb approximately 50% of the remaining water. The descending branch is permeable to water. The ascending branch is not permeable to water. Ascending actively pumps sodium out of the tubular fluid into the interstitial fluid. Very simply, if we need more sodium back, Descending, ascending loop of Henle. This is where the sodium is pumping. Reabsorption and secretion along the renal tubule. The distal convoluted tubule and collection system, by the time that it reaches the distal convoluted tubule, 80% of the water and 85% of the solutes have been reabsorbed. The distal convoluted tubule contains ion pumps that respond to the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone is a mineral corticotoid. Aldosterone comes from the adrenal cortex, and higher, the higher the aldosterone levels, the more sodium ions are reclaimed. So just a quick note on this. If more sodium ions are reclaimed, then water is going to follow sodium. Very simple. So that means that we're going to pull more and more water back into the system. The amount of water reabsorbed along the distal convoluted tubule 
and the collection ducts is controlled by circulating levels of antidiuretic hormone. And this comes from the posterior pituitary. Um, absence of antidiuretic hormone uh, in the distal convoluted tubulin collection ducts are impermeable to water. And the high levels of ADH are seen the greater the water permeability and the more concentrated the urine becomes. Very simply, antidiuretic hormone is anti-peeing hormone. It will concentrate the urine. Summary of kidney function and urine formation. Glomerular filter produced that resembles plasma. The proximal convoluted tubule dissolves nutrients and reabsorbs tubular fluid and pretty much is, is unchanged. Proximal convoluted tubule in the descending loop of Henle, water moves into the interstitial fluid and concentrates the tubular fluid, which is on its way to become urine. In the ascending loop is impermeable to water, and, this, and the solutes in the tubule cells actively pump sodium and chloride. Urea accounts for a greater proportion of solutes in the tubular fluid at this point. Final compos composition and concentration of the tubular fluid are determined by events underway at the distal convoluted tubule and the collection ducts. Impermeable solutes but ions may be, it's impermeable to solutes, but ions may be actively transported in or out of the filter at this point. Concentrations of urine is controlled by variations in the water permeability of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. Impermeable to water unless exposed to anti-peeing hormone or anti-diuretic hormone. All right, quick overview here, quick rundown. <clears throat> In the cortex, and this is the globe monitor. As afferent comes in, we have filtered in the proximal convoluted tubule that develops here. <clears throat> the descending branch is clearly permeable to water. If we need more water, depending on the oncotic pressure, <clears throat> and that would be the pull, the negative resistance on the pressure, water moves out, concentrating the air. In the loop, in the, in the ascending branch, the movement of sodium and chloride out into the interstitial fluid at this point, depending on the reabsorption needs of the body. Once in the distal convoluted tubule, this is under the absence, so this means no ADH. And this would be from the central nervous system. And if we'll notice, we have very few, this is very, very thin urine. High volume of diluted urine is coming up. Same thing over here. Only different. This is under the presence of ADH. We still have the same process all the way down. Water moves back out, concentrating the urine even more until this here is small volume of concentrated urine. And this will be under the presence of ADH or anti peeing hormone. Bigger picture of the same thing that we just talked about. Uh, glomerulus here, filtration, filter, nutrients are moved in and out, permeable to water, water moves out, not permeable to water, but sodium chloride moves out, the ascending limb is, is thicker. Distal convoluted tubule, water moving out, if it's under the effects of ADH and aldosterone, sodium, Reutilized, moving back in, water follows the sodium. Urine is more concentrated. Clinical note, acute renal failure. Deterioration in renal function over hours or days. And the number one cause of this in like trauma and medical things uh, prolonged hypotension causes acute tubular necrosis, and this would be from inadequate blood supply into the actual glomerulus. Trauma-related kidney failure. I should have an eye there. I have all these. Uh, recovery depends upon renal blood flow or when you can restore renal blood flow. Very simply, they have a shelf life as well. If we cut them off for four to six hours without ample blood supply, good possibility that they will go into permanent renal failure. Control of kidney function, uh, local regulation of kidney function, sympathetic activation in kidney function, 
uh, hormonal control of, and kidney fun of kidney function. Uh, clinical note here, uh, hemodialysis. Uh, renal failure can be acute or chronic. Blood comes into contact with a large semi-permeable membrane. On the opposite side is a special substance called diacylate. Uh, target substances are removed through the diffusion into the diacylate. I'm going to blank the screen and explain this a little better here. The white screen. So we have a semi-permeable membrane. So this is the diacylate. And then this would be the blood. Let's say that the person's metabolic demands produced uh, a potassium level in their body of eight every day and a half. So how this works to remove the toxins would be there's going to be a balance uh, after the dialysis occurs. And let me explain this. In the blood, the person has an eight potassium to begin with. In the diacylate, we mixed it to a K of zero, eight. So what's going to occur is it's going to move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until we have a balanced osmotic pressure on both sides. So this is what I mean by blood comes in contact with a large semi-permeable membrane. On the opposite side is a special substance called diacylate. The diacylate is mixed to the patient's need. Target substances are removed through diffusion into the diacylate. Clinical note, uh, the treatment of kidney failure. Um, management of acute renal failure. Um, restrictive dietary proteins. Uh, byproducts of protein, water and salt, and reducing caloric intake to a minimum. And then obviously they can form, perform dialysis. Dialysis in some situations can be done through peritoneal dialysis. And this would be the patient filling their abdominal cavity with diacylate using their peritoneal cavity as a semi-permeable memory. Or they can do hemodialysis, which means that every other day they'll have to go in, or three times a week, they would have to go in and set and have the artificial machine run dialysis on them. And then obviously the most complete way would be, uh, or to treat a kidney failure, would be to replace their kidneys if they were absolutely going And this would be done through a kidney transplant. This is going to end part one. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith, 405-219-7613, smithr.nsa.net. Thank you.